morning. Welcome to worship at Schenkel United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to the sanctuary on this first Sunday in Lent. Let us pause for a moment of prayer as we begin our time of worship together. Loving and gracious God, we give thanks for this time that we can gather in our homes, still separated because of the pandemic, but because of technology, we can reach out to one another and we can be in this time and space to worship you. We pray that you would open our hearts to your word as you remind us of your steadfast love and faithfulness, of your good plans for all of your creation, and of your continued presence in our lives. May our worship this morning be in spirit and in truth. Amen. Good morning, friends. Uh, my name is Louise Hein. I've been a member here since the 80s, 1980s. Um, one of the things that we do for Lent, that I do for Lent, is that I read a book that has a special meaning. The first book I read was I, Judas by Taylor, Taylor Caldwell. <laughs> And it was a, a book about Judas's life with Jesus and his perspective on um, what it was to be a follower of Christ. Um, since then, I have read several other books, um, one about a gentleman and his dog that were in the um, Twin Towers when the 911 happened and how his dog saved him and many other people uh, from the building. That was a very moving uh, book. Uh, I have read many others and also as part of my Lenten practice, I usually do the uh, Lenten book that we have here at the church. Uh, the one this year is called Lent of Liberation. Um, Confronting the Legacy of American Slavery. Uh, this one sounds like it should be interesting, so we'll get into that. One of the other things that Tootie and I used to do uh, was um, we prepared the social hall for uh, Monday Thursday service. Go ahead and tell about it. Uh, we would set it up in different ways if the pastor wanted to have at one point we had communion, we had two tables set up with Christ in the center portrayed by a chair covered with a purple cloth. Um, and we had six seats on each side of the table to represent the Last Supper. And this is where we took communion. We also prepared with our confirmands as we were um, their mentors uh, we had several confirmands that helped us prepare the meal, which was usually a soup and sometimes a salad or just soup and bread, a very simple meal. And it would be served here in the social hall. That was, uh, that was during the time that I was still working and I would take the day off. I would also. Because it was just felt like I should do that as part of my Lent offerings or whatever you want to call it. But we would, it was a good time with working with the kids, with the youth, with the confirmands. And um, I just, I, I, that is, is kind of what I'm missing right now, but hey, we'll go with the flow and whatever is happens, it happens. So. We set the room up many different ways, and after we got the, the big room, we really had 
a way to expand and do different things. It was. Uh, we also did a foot washing one year mm -hmm. when Pastor Dan was still here. No, Pastor Brian. Oh, Pastor Brian. Sorry. Uh, but uh, we enjoyed doing that very much. and missed that. Thank you. See you. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. O oh God, we confess that we are reluctant to move into this Lenten journey to Jerusalem. The past appears pleasant in comparison with the future unknown. We meet pressing human need with fear and pain and inaction. In a chorus with worshipers everywhere, we say, we have fallen short. We live in a state of brokenness and alienation. We have sinned. O oh God, our sustainer and redeemer, help us to discover the gifts of power, talent, and energy which you give us, that we might bring healing into a broken world. Forgive our sin, strengthen our resolve, and renew us in your ever vibrant spirit. Amen. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are set free.
Our text from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, is from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, God instructs sinners in the way. God leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble God's way. All the paths of God are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep God's covenant and decrees. And our second text is also from the Hebrew Scriptures, from Genesis chapter 9. This is God speaking. As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Thanks be to God. So when I read the texts for this Sunday, I decided to go with the Genesis 9 text because it talks about covenant. And that's the part that stood out for me. In the UCC, we talk about covenant, the United Church of Christ. We talk about being in covenant with other churches, with the national church body, and within our church, we're in covenant with one another. A covenant being, being an agreement that we commit to be in a relationship together. And in this text in Genesis 9, obviously it follows the well-known story of the flood and Noah in the ark. But one of the things that is unique about this covenant so early in our Hebrew scriptures is that this covenant is a unilateral covenant that only one party is held to a certain responsibility and that is God. And God is promising in this covenant to never again destroy the earth with the waters of a flood. 
There is no responsibility placed on humanity or on the animals or any other part of creation. So it's a little different than lots of covenants that we are accustomed to because usually both parties agree to be in this covenant together and have parts that they are each to uphold to stay faithful to the covenant. And so this covenant in its uniqueness is also interesting to me because, well, is something I had not thought about, although I've often thought of the rainbow. I grew up with this story, and every time I see a rainbow, I mean, who doesn't love a rainbow? And the beauty of the colors, and it's usually after a rainstorm, or it might still be raining where you are, and you're able to see a rainbow. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing to witness and to be reminded of God's promise. And yet I had never thought about a piece of it that God says, I will set my bow in the clouds. And I had never thought of a bow as bow and arrow bow. I only thought of the bow like the rainbow. And yet as I did some reading this week, I was reminded or, or discovered that ancient people thought of lightning as arrows thrown from God or the gods, however they talked about it, that, that was, those were arrows. And so obviously God would need a bow to shoot arrows of lightning. And so that added another piece for me as I thought about this. And then to think about the bow usually goes like this, right? We see it in the sky. It's usually like this. It is unstrung. So God's weapon is no longer a weapon. If you know much about bows and arrows, you have to have the string on the bow to be able to pull it back with the arrow to shoot an arrow. And without a string, it is just a bow, a rainbow. And God has promised to set the bow in the clouds, pointed away from the earth, unstrung, never again to destroy the earth, with waters of a flood. And I was reminded as I read uh, Dr. Brueggemann, who is a great Hebrew scripture scholar, that this has echoes of earlier in Genesis, where after creation, at the end of all the creation, when God created things and every day God saw that it was good, and then at the Sabbath on the seventh day, God rested. And here we had the flood and recreation. So the waters subsided and then God makes this covenant with Noah and those who were saved in the ark to God is resting God's weapon. God rested on the Sabbath. And here in chapter nine, God is resting God's weapon. And as Dr. Brueggemann says that God has, has turned, in this covenant, God has turned to God's creation in a new way, with a new, fresh willingness to be in relationship with all of creation, with humanity and all of the animals and all of the creation on the earth. Because it is not only for human life that it is stated, that God states this, but for all the animals and all, all creatures on the earth that God makes this covenant. And as we begin this Lenten journey, where we walk with Jesus toward the cross, and we know that at Holy Week we will, we will stay with Jesus, 
We will be with Jesus and the disciples at the Last Supper. We will witness his betrayal and his trial and his death. That as we make this journey, maybe we begin it on this first Sunday by making a journey to the other side of God. Not the familiar terrain of what we have often called God's omniscience, God's knowledge, or God's omnipotence, God's power. But we are making this journey to a different side. We see a different side of God. During Lent, at Holy Week, and certainly at the cross, we see vulnerability. We see weakness as Jesus hangs on the cross. And that is where we see God in Jesus fully embracing all of human experience, even death. And that is our Lenten journey. We begin it with this covenant. And when we think of the ancient Hebrew people as they write about what they believe about God in the Hebrew scriptures, along with power and justice, patience and love. The ancient Hebrews also perceived that God was inherently self-giving, willing to enter into a relationship that limited God's prerogatives. That's pretty amazing. And we find it in the ninth chapter of Genesis at the beginning of our scriptures. So as we walk through this journey of Lent together, we are reminded from this text in God's covenant making, and also from the Psalms, that all the paths of God are steadfast love and faithfulness. God is inherently self-giving. We see that in Jesus and in God's willingness to be vulnerable, to be weak, to experience death, and then to raise Jesus to new life and assure us that indeed God always desires our thriving and more life. Thanks be to God for a covenant-making covenant-keeping God that we can be in relationship with this kind of God who, whose paths are steadfast love and faithfulness. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
I invite you to be with me in an attitude of prayer as we lift up the prayers of the people. Loving God, we give thanks once again for this opportunity to come before you in prayer. And we lift up today some of our members and ask for your blessings upon them this week for Tisha and BJ, for Brenda and Randy, for Lindsay, for Claire and Jim. We ask for your blessing, for wisdom and decisions they need to make, for safekeeping in all of their work, and that their lights might shine brightly for you. We pray today also for all those whose lives have been adversely affected by the storms, for those who've been suffering with no electricity or heat, especially the people in Texas where they are not used to having snowstorms. We lift up all those who continue to deal with COVID-19 and the losses of family and loved ones and friends we lift up all those who are unemployed and pray for provision for them for employment and safety in their employment. We lift up also our president and vice president, members of the cabinet in, in their difficult work in trying to get vaccines out and trying to accomplish things for the good of all people. We ask for your blessing, for encouragement and courage for them every day in the face of daunting amounts of work. We pray today also for all those who live with mental health challenges and for their families who walk with them and friends and spouses. And we pray that they would be able to find the medical help that they need the counselors that would be helpful for them, that they would be able to have medicine that is helpful for their living and their thriving. We lift up also today those among us who continue to have health concerns. For Barb, we ask for a good success for her transplant. For Ken and Rosemary, for Bruce and Nancy, for David and for his family as they miss him, we ask for your blessings upon the doctors and nurses who are caring for people that you would give them wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with compassion in their work. We lift up today also those unspoken requests that are known only to you and to perhaps one person. We ask for your blessing of comfort and grace, for wisdom in decisions that need to be made, for courage to make difficult decisions. And we thank you for your continued presence with us and that you have given to us in Jesus Christ a prayer that we can pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now as we go into this Lenten week, may you be reminded always that you and I are in relationship with a covenant-keeping God, a God who is willing to go to great lengths to be in relationship with us, a God who puts reminders in the sky of God's covenant. Remember that all God's ways are steadfast love and faithfulness. And go forth empowered to live faithfully and joyfully through this Lenten journey. Go in the peace of Christ.